Well, what an exciting, exciting weekend for all of us to uh, be together. If this is your very, very first time, I just want you to know, I mean, this is such a great weekend for you to take a step into uh, the life of Tri-County Church and just to check out what's going on. You're going to hear a bunch of cool things about what God is doing in the life of his church. If you've been part of Tri-County Church from the very beginning, what an exciting weekend for you to uh, just be connected with us. And if you're like me, you're somewhere in between, you know, you weren't here at the very beginning, but it's not your first time. I'm just just letting you know, what an exciting, exciting weekend as we kick off this series titled Unlock. Now, there's going to be three years that, uh, we're going to be making our way through today, and uh, here's what I know about, well, at least two out of the three of these years, uh, two of these years, uh, for some of you, uh, you, you never experienced those years, or maybe one out of the two you didn't experience, and you weren't alive, so you couldn't have experienced it. For some of you, uh, uh, maybe one of these years were like the best year ever, like when you think back to that year, you're like, that was an amazing year, and for some of you, uh, maybe one of those years was like, one of, you know those years in life, it meant like an entire year. It wasn't like a bad week. It wasn't a bad month. It was a bad year. Maybe for you, like this is one, hopefully it's not one of the bad years. But here's what I know. You will all have, unless you weren't alive, you'll all have memories at some level attached to these years, at least two of these years. The first one is 1987. Good year? Bad year? <laughs> You're like, oh, you picked that year. In 1987, uh, the fall of 1987, I was entering into uh, my freshman year of high school. Yes, I was a freshman in high school. And uh, it's interesting when I, when I just say those words, because this last week, uh, my wife and I, on Tuesday night, uh, we walked our oldest daughter, Kiera, across the soccer field. It was senior night. I'm like, how does that happen? I started coaching Kara when she was four years old. Four years old, out on the soccer field. And next thing I know, my wife and I, I mean, arm in arm with Kara, we walked across the soccer field as they announced her, you know, as a senior. I'm like, how does that happen? In 1987, my wife, Kim, uh, she was entering uh, uh, her eighth grade year, uh, which I guess just me stating that, you now know how old she is. She's 31. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) some of you are doing the math, you're like, really? No. She's 31, really she is. And uh, she was entering her eighth grade year of high school, and right now my wife and I, uh, our youngest daughter, Claire, she's in eighth grade. That was 1987. What was life like for you in 1987? Good year, bad year? Do you remember that? Were you in diapers in 1987? Were you not alive in 1987? You know, what was 1987? What's interesting about the year 1987, there was a, a reporter, not from a small town, kind of a medium-sized town, uh, but it was a a local newspaper that this reporter was, what was it, tasked, assigned to write an article about, about a guy that was transitioning jobs. He was going from one line of work, one career path, and not just a small change, and he was, it was a pretty dramatic change, so much so that the local newspaper said, we should write a story about this, this guy who's going through a pretty significant life change. And so she got tasked to write this story, March 19th, 1987, to be exact. And what's interesting, she went, she did the job, she took some photos, she write, wrote up the story. That story went into the local newspaper, and someone actually clipped out that story. And 35 years later, somehow, that newspaper clipping of this story about this guy that switched career paths, found its way over 61 miles away into a book that was given to a local Goodwill store that someone walked into and purchased a bunch of items. One happened to be this book with this newspaper story, this newspaper clipping inserted into. 
And when this person got home, she was going through the items that she purchased, and this newspaper clipping, well, it fell out of the book. She gave it to her husband. Her husband happened, just happened, to be part of a very small team that we had put together to help us figure out how to launch more churches in more local communities. We happened to have a meeting that night, and Mark came rushing in, said, you can't believe what my wife just found in a book that she purchased from Goodwill. The date, March 19th, 1987. He handed, handed me this, this article. And the headline on this newspaper clipping was, Seneca Valley teacher trades classroom for pulpit. It's a story about our founding pastor, Dave Bish. March 19th, 1987. I sat there in that room and I'm reading this story. Years and years and years before Tri-County Church was even an idea, God was scripting a story. This article talks about Dave's spiritual journey. At one point in the story, Dave talks about how um, so many times in culture, Christianity is relegated to this pie-in-the-sky faith. And what Dave talks about is that, no, Christianity isn't that at all. That real Christianity is, his words, rain, stuck cars, and mud. But in the face of adversity, there's hope and salvation. But what captured my heart was how this article started and how this article ended. You see, one of the first things that this reporter captured and wrote down was when Dave said this, Bish's goal is to follow Christ in the biblical way, a path that will probably have few trappings of convention, he says. And the last thing that she wrote, I have a feeling that I'm going to be a very unconventional pastor. Now, I never had an opportunity to meet Dave. Some of you did. But I've heard story after story after story from family, from close friends, and I just tell you, that word unconventional is a word that truly described Dave's life. A word that would be deep rooted into the life of Tri County Church. But you see, that word unconventional isn't just a word attached to, to our founding pastor, it, it's a word that well, really describes God. Think about all of God's unconventional ways. Over and over again, when I, when I read about these, these moments throughout the course of time, I'm just like, How, why did God do it that way? Do you find yourself scratching your head going, that, that, I mean, he could have done it so, so much simpler. There's an easier way. But God is an unconventional God, and his ways are always unconventional. Think about the life of Jesus. How God decided for Jesus to enter into this world. Think about how unconventional it was. There were so many other ways that God could have orchestrated Jesus entering this world. But God decided, hey, Jesus needs to enter this world through this storyline. A teenage girl trying to convince her soon-to-be husband that she didn't cheat on him. A teenage girl trying to convince her parents that she wasn't that girl that got pregnant before marriage. A teenage girl that was trying to tell an entire local community that were caught up in her scandal that God was doing something seismic. I mean, we now sing songs about that. 
But could you imagine being in that local community, hearing this teenage girl tell this story? What would you think of her? God's unconventional ways. You think about the life of Jesus, his first recorded miracle. Wasn't healing someone who, who needed to be healed? No. Nope. It wasn't feeding someone that was starving? No. Nope. His first recorded miracle? You, if you've missed it, you should. He's in an argument with his mom, which I just think is classic. They're at a wedding. The wedding party's going on, and during that day and that culture, weddings were days long. Not hours, days. And all of a sudden, mom hears that they've ran out of wine. Mom goes to son, knowing that he could do something about it, and says, hey, hey, son, <laughs> now's your time. Come on, come on, let's do something. Jesus argues with mom, but finally decides to do something about it. He turns water into wine, not just okay wine, the best wine. First miracle? An argument with mom? A wedding celebration? And you think about this moment with Jesus. He's nailed to a piece of wood. He strikes up a conversation with a guy next to him that was also nailed to a piece of wood. And in this life conversation, Jesus, in the most amount of pain a human being could ever face, it's something that we can't even comprehend, the amount of pain he was in. He looks at this guy next to him, that's not going anywhere. He says, today, you will be with me forever. Think about God's unconventional ways. People want to put God in a small little box, and here's what I know. Every time I try to put God in a small little box, God does things that just blows my mind. In God's unconventional way, he's called unconventional people. Like a junior high graphic arts teacher. You think about the people that God has tapped on their shoulders over the course of time. I mean, the, the king of Israel. Not the first one that God allowed the people to pick. No, God's choice. It was the runt of the family. Didn't look like a king, didn't talk like a king. Didn't present himself like a king. And God said, that's my king. You look at who Jesus chose to be his leadership team, to move the church to be the hope of the world. They weren't the, the upper class people, they weren't the most intelligent people, they weren't the most educated people. They didn't come from the most influential of cities. Small town people, hard workers. And then there was this one guy that no other religious, spiritual person liked. He was a sleazeball. And God said, yeah, you too, come with me. And in God's unconventional ways, he's always leveraged the unconventional people, <laughs> which we call the church, a gathering of people. So I think about the story of Tri-County Church, a small group of people coming together to launch an unconventional church in an unconventional region. Most church planners, they go to the big city where all the people are, and God's like, mm, there needs to be a movement across small town USA. And he planted within this small group of people a vision to be an unconventional church. And for some of you, you know this, especially if you're a guest with us. If you're a guest, maybe you're online checking things out. And if you've had any type of church background, you know that feeling for some of you. You've been here a long time, but the first time you walked in, stepped into the life of Tri-County Church, you remember that feeling, that feeling coming in. And if you have any type of church history background, you know that experience. You walk in, you're like, this is like no other church I've been to. 
There's people at doors smiling. That's like no other church I've been to. I walk in and people are actually excited to see me. That's like no other church I've been to. They have coffee and donuts. Were you raised? I was. I was raised in the church on the, in my early years. The church changed over time, but in the early years, right, where the sanctuary was God's holy place, and you would never eat or drink in the sanctuary. Some of you still can't. You're like, I'll just eat my donut really fast before I go in. You walked in. You looked around. You had your dress on, your suit and tie on. You realized, oh, this is different than other churches. But then something about it connected with you. To reach people with an unconventional approach. We're unapologetic about our unconventional approach. We get, as a church, we do things differently than most of our backgrounds when it comes to church. I've said it over and over again, we all have a framework. No matter what that framework is or what church is, maybe that's how you're raised, the type of church you're raised in, or maybe it's just watching movies about churches, right? How Hollywood portrays churches. We all have a framework, what we think church is, and we're just, I just want you to know, we're very unapologetic about our approach to church. Why? We worship an unconventional God who does whatever he can to connect people with the hope, the message of Jesus. Jesus' entire approach to tell people that he loves them was so unconventional. Jesus decimated cultural and religious lines to tell people they're loved. Jesus, a man considered a rabbi, would sit with women that was against every religious and cultural rule. And he did it so he could look at people and say, you are loved. Jesus would touch the untouchables, breaking cultural and religious rules. Why? To tell people, you are loved. Over and, just look at Jesus' life. Over and over and over again, Jesus broke all religious and cultural rules. Why? Because love was the message. Love was the message. I had a guy walk up to me at a previous service and said, I'd never been loved until I walked into a church like Tri-County Church and I, for the very first time, I discovered what true love really was like. The Apostle Paul, over and over and over again, broke cultural and religious rules to connect people with a message of love that is Jesus. Paul would take pagan poems and pagan songs and pagan thinking and he would draw this bridge from their thought process, from what they were reading, from what they were worshiping, from how they were living. He would draw these bridges so that he could walk with people to introduce them to Jesus over and over and over again. The apostle Paul who is the author of the vast majority of our New Testament, the story of Jesus and the launch of the church, found connection points right where people were, how they worshiped, what they were singing, what they were reading, so he could connect them to Jesus. Peter, Peter was probably out of Jesus' entire leadership team, the one that I relate to the most. Peter was this impulsive, I'm going to be first. And the most of the time, when he was the first to speak, the first to act, he got it wrong. I relate. Jesus looked at Peter and said, hey, Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not conquer it. And it was Peter, after Jesus left, the movement of the church was going. Guess what Peter didn't get? God's unconventional approach. He didn't get it. He didn't get it until one day God made it so clear to him that the message of Jesus must break out of this Jewish controlled epicenter and must go to all people. Peter wanted to uh, hold on to the the message of Jesus to himself, to where he was comfortable. And God was like, ah, Peter, 
This message has to go everywhere. And finally, finally, the light bulb went on. Over this last year, the team has done an incredible job. We've been working on what's called the Life Path. And Life Path is all about us helping partner with you to go on your spiritual journey. It's really at the epicenter of the Life Path. It's giving you tools because we want to love like Jesus and we want to live a life reflecting Jesus. And so you've been hearing about Discover TCC. And why I'm sharing about this is this is such a powerful, I mean, it's an hour of your time. Whether you've been part of Tri-County Church from the very beginning or you're just a guest with us, I mean, you're gonna learn a lot about Tri-County Church, who we are. But more than that, how to live a life reflecting Jesus. Ultimately, at the essence of who we are as a church is we want to partner with you so that your life reflects Jesus. And that's what Discover TCC really at the core is all about, is helping link arms with you to say, hey, hey, come on, come on, let's go, let's go. We all have one life. Let's love like Jesus, let's live like Jesus, let's lead like Jesus, and let's leave behind a legacy of people that love, live, and lead like Jesus love, live, and led. Take a step in and discover TCC. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you. It has the potential to change the course of your life, your marriage, your family, everyone you're connected to. The first year was 1987. The second year, 1995. This is a chair from the very first church service of Tri-County Church. I'm not sure who picked out the color. <laughs> mustard yellow isn't that attractive. Even in 1995, mustard yellow was not. Maybe 1975 mustard yellow, maybe. It's not padded. It's rusty. But 1995, a group of people following God's lead started Tri-County Church in Du Bois, Pennsylvania. And this chair represents so much. Faith. The faith to start a church. Most church plants fail. Not this one. Generosity. Giving all of themselves because a church plant, I mean, you're just doing whatever you can to gather people, to tell people about Jesus. This chair represents the message of Jesus. This chair represents hope in a dark world. This this chair represents courage. Because for those of you who've been around here a long time, you know what other people, especially other church people, have said about Tri-County Church. Because Tri-County Church doesn't fit into a conventional box, does it? And the amount of courage and faith to say we're just gonna be an unconventional church because God has called us to be an unconventional church and it's okay that other churches look different but we're just gonna continually to faithfully be the church that God has designed for us to be. This chair represents so much. And in 1995, Tri-County Church was launched. And now, we have seven physical locations in our online campus that now is reaching across state lines and around the world. You see, I think about the name Tri-County Church. The name in and of itself came to this small group of people because the vision that God had planted within them and they had no idea, they had no idea how this was gonna look. 
They didn't have an entire like uh, strat up plan that they laid out and they're like, okay, here's our 50 year goals, 25 year goals, 10 year goals. No, no, no. The vision that God had breathed into them was that this church had to be, it had to impact more people than just do boys. And the vision that God had breathed into him was it had an impact more than just Du Bois and the surrounding cities. This vision that God had breathed into him had to cross county lines. The vision from the very beginning that God breathed into him was that this new church, this unconventional church filled with unconventional people, to reach people with an unconventional approach, had to break out of county lines. And so they named it Tri-County Church. From the very beginning, God's vision was being scripted. Now, what I think is hilarious about this, by the way, I, th- I think about these things. I'm not saying you think about these things. This is, I'm a church guy. I think about these things. So the first location, you know, the Dubois location was in Clearfield County. That's one county. The second location was in downtown uh, Dubois. That's still, uh, right, that's still Clearfield County. The, the third location uh, was launched in Clearfield, which is still in Clearfield County. The fourth location was in Grampian, which is still in Clearfield County. And then God, I think God does this, by the way, just to keep people on their toes and to make us laugh. Our fifth location wasn't in Jefferson or, or Elk, was in Clinton County. Not even part of the original framework of the Tri-County area. Then we launched online, which busted us out all over the place. Now we have Ridgeway up in Elk County and Punxsutawney in Jefferson County. So I started thinking about it. We have now, now seven physical locations in four different counties. So I think we should change our name to Quad County. <laughs> and as I was thinking about this, going, that, that'd be great. And then all of a sudden I started thinking, like, well, that, I mean, Quad County sounds okay. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait until we get to eight counties, Octo County Church. Doesn't it have a ring to it, anyone? Like, hey, welcome to, o-. you have to say it with voice inflection, Octo County Church, right? And no, we're not changing our name. Some of you are getting the cold sweats or changing the name. I still think Octo County would be amazing. But think about that. Before we even launched campuses out of Clearfield, God had already taken us way beyond. Way beyond. I get asked this question a lot. What's the vision? Where are we going next, Chris? Where are we going next? Where are we going next? This is what I know. In the state of Pennsylvania, there's 2,564 municipalities. Out of those 2,564 municipalities, 722 of them are the size of 4,000 or bigger. I've been asked, is there a town too small that you won't go to? I'm like, Grampians, like 365 people. No, no, why? We're not the best church, hear that, hear this. We're not, we're not like the cool church, we're not. We don't think we have it all together because we don't. My heart is for every church to thrive. That's my, we want to help every church to thrive. That's the goal. But here's what we do know. We We know what God has designed us to be and to do, and we're okay to say, okay, we we will be the unconventional church, and every local community needs a church like Tri-County Church. It needs different churches that are alive and are thriving. That's awesome. But we also know that every church, every community needs a church like us, and we just know God's moving. God is moving. As you all stepped into one of our physical campuses, you received this vision guide. For all of you uh, connecting online right now, uh, you'll get a link. 
And um, we wanted to provide this link not just for the online campus, but also for some of you, you love digital. Like I, have, I, I save everything digitally on my computer, on my desktop. It's, it's, it's crazy. It reflects my brain, but it's crazy. But you can go to tccconline.church slash give, and you can, you can download all of this. So you can have digital copies, which is awesome. But there's this vision guide, and there's a commitment card. Just know, over the next four weeks, we're going to talk a whole bunch about this. Okay, so for some of you, like, you, you have questions, and we will answer all those questions. We just wanted to get you some vision so you know where we're going over this series. So we're going to talk a lot about this, a whole bunch about this. But here's the one thing I'm asking for you to do. is so pray. Right now, as we move forward, and there's two things I'm going to ask you to pray for specifically this week. Pray about your part in God's mission within his church. It's his church, it's not my church. It's his mission, not my mission. He's the unconventional God. We're just trying to follow in his footsteps. Pray about your part in God's mission. The church, the hope of the world. Even if this is your first time, man, pray about it. There's a reason you're here. The reason you're here, second thing, start praying about your generosity journey into God's mission. Into God's mission. We'll talk a lot, a whole bunch more about that as we move forward. But just start praying. Just start praying. Jesus, in John chapter 17, the gospel of John, Jesus is praying. In the first part of his prayer He's talking between him and God the Father. The second part of the prayer, he's praying over his disciples, his leadership team. But what he prays at the very, very end, because when he gets done praying, he says amen, he gets arrested, he gets beaten, he gets crucified. If you, know, if you knew you were going to die, if you knew you were going to get hammered uh, to a piece of wood, what would you pray for? And Jesus, at the very, very end, after he gets done praying between him and God the Father and praying over his disciples, his leadership team, what Jesus prays for blows my mind. At the very beginning of the prayer, he says, after Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven, which I just think these are powerful moments, by the way. Maybe you were raised in the faith context where, where prayer, you had to close your eyes, like you had to. Like if you peeked during a prayer, like you got yelled at. What I love is Jesus, well, his eyes were open. And I think there's something powerful about just looking up. Saying, God, you and me are gonna talk right now. He looked towards heaven and he prayed. And this was the last thing he prayed for. My prayer is not for them alone, meaning the disciples, his leadership team. I pray also for those who will believe in me. Think about this moment. Jesus is there knowing what's to come. And all of a sudden he said, hey God, I'm praying for these disciples. And you know, you know that they doubt. God, you know that they have faith issues. God, you know that they have question issues. God, you know they have courage issues. God, you know. But we have assembled this team to move the message of hope to all people. We call it the church. And Jesus prays, like, and God, I'm praying for every single person who will believe in me through their message. What was their message? It was so simple. Jesus came. We walked with him, he died for you, we saw it, he was buried, and then God rose him from the dead. Trust in him, his love covers all. That was how simple the message was. And Jesus starts praying for every single person who will ever believe in the message of him. He goes on, he goes, that all of them may be one, because here's the thing, when we, when, when we unite with Jesus' message, that's why we say love first, unity happens. People come together. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, 
may they also be in us so that the world, the world may believe. The world? The world? I think as Jesus prayed the, these words, he's like, hey God, hey God, I know these guys think the world is like Jerusalem and Galilee and Israel, maybe a little further north, maybe further east, you know, west is the Mediterranean. They think that's the world. And God, you know what the world is. I think Jesus, as he's praying these words, for all who will believe, so that the world, the world may know. I think Jesus started to think about moments like this, where he had your image in his mind. And when he said the, world, the, the word world, he was thinking about places like Dubois. He was thinking about places like Avis. He was thinking like, about places like Sykesville and Big Run and Ridgeway and, and Punxsy and Clearfield and Grampian and Kerwinsville and Phillipsburg and Tyrone. He was thinking about uh, places like State College and Lock Haven. He was thinking about uh, places like, like Benazette. He was thinking about all of these places. He's like, so the world will know. I heard my dad one time as a small boy, probably around 1987, say to someone who's kind of complaining about the size of the church, you know what my dad said to this person who was complaining that the church got too big? My dad, with so much love, looked at this person and said, when did the church get too big? Right before you came or right after you came? The world will know. The world will know. I think about the 2,564 municipalities just in Pennsylvania alone and how many of these towns desperately, desperately need a church that understands that the number one mission of the church is to love like Jesus loved. And if we love by serving people, it can change the fabric, the foundation of every local community. The vision of the church is to go everywhere we can with a message of love. That is Jesus. If you're a Christ follower, that is your calling. That is your life. That's not the pastor's life. That's yours. To love like Jesus loved. How did he love? By serving everyone. To love people to Jesus. That's how we connect people to Jesus. We love them like Jesus would love them. And through our love, guess what? They lean in. They lean in. And I think Jesus is sat there in the middle of the small little room, about ready to be crucified. He goes, God, one day there's going to be this church called Tri-County Church, and they have the potential to change the fabric of Pennsylvania and the world. God, I pray for those who will believe in me. Why? Because the world may believe that, God, you sent me for everyone, for everyone. He goes on, he goes, I've given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know. The world, the world, Weedville and Brockway and Brookville and Clarion, Woodward, the world, the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus said amen. And then he was arrested to give his life so that the world, the world would know. The world would know. Nineteen eighty seven. God breathes into a graphic arts teacher to take a courageous step of faith that he had no clue how eight years later that would manifest itself. In nineteen ninety five, sitting on rusty unpadded, mustard yellow folding chairs. God started an unconventional church. And in 2020, Tri-County Church turns 25 years old, which is really a pretty young church when you, we think about it. And you see, unlock what we're gonna be talking about over the next four or five weeks. It's all about what God has been doing 
is doing, and wants to do. You see, there's this word more. And when more is connected to us, to ourselves, it can so easily become me-centric. When more is connected to ourselves, when we hold on to more, it can be so self-serving, selfish, can it be? If you've ever raised small kids, maybe you were those parents, we were those parents, right? Before our kids could talk, we taught them the more sign. It's like, what did we do? But when it's connected to ourselves, right, that's, that's where more goes. But when more is connected to God, something beyond our imagination happens. In a moment, we're going to sing these words. And I ask that this is your prayer, that you just make this song your prayer in this moment. God, how great you are and great things you have done. With everything we've seen, there is more to come. In every victory and every battle won, with everything we've seen, God, there is more to 